I have uh, two separate portions of this talk. The first portion, I'm going to talk about my relationship with Jesus Christ and what that means. If that's not of interest to you, just bear with me. That's only going to be about 20% of the talk. The rest of it is going to have nothing to do with with my faith, per se, it is going to be a purely scientific demonstration. So if that's what you want, there's going to be plenty of it, all right? What I'd like to do, because this has been organized by, by Campus Crusade, by crew, by crew, is I'd like to open in a word of prayer. If this is not something that you're familiar with, just roll with it for, for a minute, and then we'll be past that, and we're going to get right into it, okay? Let's pray. Abba, Father, I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come and to speak in this place, on this campus, where you visited me 40 years ago and spoke into my heart and into my life. And Father, I pray for your outpouring in this time that you would take and awake, if there be anybody here who's not a believer in Jesus, that you would show them yourself. Kindly speak to their hearts, I pray. And Father, for those here who know you that are struggling, Father, draw them closer to you because of this time. Lord, I lift this time up to you, and I ask for your grace and your mercies and your power for the glory of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to start by just speaking a little bit about an overview of the different projects that we have in my group. And uh, we work on many different topics, ranging from laser-induced graphene, which we can make on food, we can make on, on uh, coconuts, uh, graphene nanoribbons, which I'm going to show you a little bit more about and how we're using those uh, um, in medicine now. Uh, we work in this area of nanocars where we're able to build little motors into cars. And these cars are very small, and these motors spin at actually at 3 million rotations per second. And so they spin rather quickly. Uh, these cars are small enough that we can park about 50,000 of them across the diameter of a human hair. So they're very small. And, uh, uh, and, and with these, these fast rotating motors that activate by shining light, we're using the same motors to target certain cells certain cell types and drill holes in those cells and we're going after a way to quickly destroy cancer cells that way where we just drill right through the membrane of a cell. We have uh, uh, graphene oxide. We, we, we developed a procedure for graphene oxide which is now used worldwide and it's very good for capturing radio radioactive materials from water for water cleanup. It gives you a general overview of some of the areas that we work in. This is a rat. This rat has had its spinal cord completely cut in half at C5 at the base of the neck. And then we put one drop of graphene nanoribbons in, and the, there's immediate communication between the brain and the bottom of the body. And so now the brain is remapping the bottom of the body in the first week, and by, the, by two weeks after surgery, this rat is walking around with a completely cut in half spinal cord. And that's with one drop of a 1% solution of, of pegylated graphene nanoribbons. And at week two, he scored an 18 out of 21 on, mo on a mobility scale, 21 being, being a, a, a fully restored mobility. And now here, here he is after three weeks, uh, uh, just, just ready to run, ready to go. And uh, uh, at this, this point, he scored a, 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 a 19 out of 21 on a mobility scale with a completely cleaved spinal cord that had been remended with graphene nanoribbons. And so this is uh, a new company has started on this called NeuroCords. And uh, that's again to try to, uh, to rebuild spinal cords after, after accidents where, where you get a cut or a contusion in, in, in injury. So it gives you this small overview of some of the things that we work on in our group. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you the story of the good news of how I came to faith in Jesus Christ that happened just a couple hundred yards from here in the Lawrence and Dormitory. So I was 1977, August 1977, I was doing laundry in the, it was in the basement of Lawrence and Dormitory was the laundry room. Is it still there in the basement? Yeah? Okay. Well, I was doing, it, it was my first load of laundry and, and I was, uh, 
talking to a guy in the laundry room and he played on the football team and I asked him if he wanted to play pro ball when he graduated. He says, oh no, I'm not good enough for that. I said, what do you want to do? He said, well, maybe lay ministry. And I said, what's lay ministry? He said, oh, like a missionary. I said, missionary? We don't need missionaries today. It's 1977. Why do we need missionaries? We got TV. He just put it in there with TV. Why do we need missionaries? He, he, and he said, can I give you an illustration of the gospel? I said, sure. And so he drew this on a piece of paper. He had people on one side, God on the other, and he had sin, this chasm of sin that was separating us from God. And then he opened up the Bible and he had me read this verse. This is the first verse that I remember reading from the Bible. I grew up in a Jewish home just outside of New York City. And, and uh, I don't ever remember reading, reading the Bible and, and uh, uh, certainly not understanding it. It says, <clears throat> Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. And he said, you know, he was a bit taken back by that. And in modern secular Judaism, the background that I came from, we didn't think about sin very much. We didn't dwell on it. You can go to the synagogue once a year and, and, and uh, uh, on Yom Kippur and, and you're good to go. I never really thought much about this. And I said, look, how can I be a sinner? I never killed anyone and I never robbed a bank. So then he had me read another verse from the Bible. And it says in Matthew 5, 28, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now that really hit me. Not only was I 18 years old at the time, but I was addicted to pornography. I had become addicted to pornography at the age of 14. And I was working on the Hutchinson River Parkway and these gas stations going into and out of the city on each side of the road. And, and uh, my first job at the age of 14 was to clean the parking lots. And I noticed that the men would throw away their magazines on Friday nights on their way home from, from uh, their work week. And I picked up these magazines and I became quickly addicted. And when I read that verse, it was the first time in my life I was ever convicted of my sin. Everybody has something that convicts them of their sin. When I saw that I was convicted of my sin, this was a new experience for me and it really hit me. Then he had me read another verse from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And I remember he drew this arrow. He said, people try many good works to try to get them over to God, but it's never sufficient. The Bible says that our good works are not sufficient, won't get us to God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't even know that there was such a claim on the table. And he drew this cross that bridged this gap, and he had me read this, this verse. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How can any thinking man or woman believe in a physical resurrection from the dead? I mean, we don't have a whole lot of data points on that. I've never seen that happen. How can you believe that? Unless God has placed it within the heart of every man and woman. And I'm amazed because I've shared this with many people over these last 40 years since I first heard this. And I'm amazed at the number of people that will say to me, I can believe Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. God has placed this amazing thing in the hearts of many people. Since then, I've studied the very resurrection and I have whole teachings on the physical resurrection. But that's not a topic for today. But he talked about how that could get me to God. And then it was on the night of November 7th, 1977, I was in that building. And you all know that building. That's Lawrence and Dormitory. And I was in room 1812. That's my room. And uh, uh, this was in November. Remember, he had shared with me in August. Now it's November. I had attended a little Bible study on the Gospel of John in, in the common room on that floor uh, for a few months. And I was all alone in that room, and I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I got down on my knees. I never saw Jews get down on their knees. Jews usually stand when we pray. Christians, I saw they, they would sit when they pray. And I got down on my knees, and I said, Lord, forgive me because I'm a sinner and come into my heart. And then all of a sudden, this burden that I had been carrying, that I had been convicted of my sin, that I was a sinner, and I knew I couldn't get past this thing, it just started to lift from me. And then... It was amazing how this feeling came over me and then all of a sudden this forgiveness and all of a sudden somebody was standing in my room. My roommate wasn't there, but someone was standing in my room and I thought, how can this be? How can someone be standing in my room? And I looked, where is this person? And right in front of me, someone was standing. I couldn't see them with my eyes, 
But all of a sudden, this amazing sense of forgiveness came over me, a peace like I never wanted to get up. And I just started weeping like a baby, which was very unusual for me at the time. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say, and I just enjoyed this presence. When I finally got up, I didn't tell anybody. What's this Jewish kid from New York City going to say? And uh, um, two weeks later, the guy who had shared with me, he lived on my floor, and he said, he said to me, Jim, have you received Jesus in your heart? I said, I, I think so. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Something's happened to you. I didn't realize it at that time, but I realized it sometime after that. The whole addiction that I had to pornography was gone. Just gone. That visitation on the day of salvation broke that in me. And if you've ever had an addiction, you know how compelling that can be in your life. He doesn't, he doesn't solve that in everybody's life. He did for me. He used it to convict me of my sin. He used me to show me his power. Now, I had many other things that I had to strive with for many years and continue to strive with. But that one, he absolutely broke in me. And then I was really blessed to be discipled by several great men. One was Dr. T.E. Koshi. <clears throat> from, from uh, International Assembly. He was the evangelical chaplain here. And he was the man who taught me to read the Bible. He used to say, <clears throat> you read the Bible from, <clears throat> excuse me, from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. So that's what I started doing. So for almost 40 years, <clears throat> I've had this pattern of reading the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation over and over again. So I start in Genesis chapter 1, and I just pick up where I leave off, left off the day before. And then when I hit <clears throat> Revelation chapter 22, I start again. And uh, I've had this pattern, and he learned it from Brother Bak Singh, who taught me the same thing. And then there was, <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, Professor Delmar Brosma, who was a professor of uh, entomology, who was also the pastor of the local church that I was in, and Professor uh, Buck Hatch, from, who was at Columbia Bible College at the time when we lived in South Carolina. I spent my first 11 years teaching at the University of South Carolina before I moved to Rice. So I've had great men speak into my life. That's my Christian story. <clears throat> That's my family. God has blessed me with a beautiful family. This is my daughter, Umbreen. She lives in Israel for the past 12 years. She's a mediator between Palestinians and Israelis, fluent in Hebrew and Arabic. This is her husband, Philip, and these are their two kids, my two grandchildren. This is my daughter, Sabrina. She's a lawyer in Houston. My son, Josiah, he's in, in medical school in New York City. And Ben is an investment banker. He graduated from Rice last May. He's an investment banker with J.P. Morgan uh, in the energy sector in Houston. And so, you know, I, I just look at this and, you know, every good Jewish family needs a doctor, a lawyer, and a banker. So I figure, <laughs> figure we're pretty well set here. Um, and I know what you're thinking. I know what every guy in here is thinking. How did I get such a beautiful wife? I, I think about this too, all the time. I can't believe that she married me. I think she, she thought I was really rich or that I was going to become really rich. She didn't know that I was only going to make nano dollars. I mean, I just... But anyway, she's, she's, she's a wonderful lady, and God really blessed me. I prayed a lot. I, I would break every day at noontime. I would go up to Hendricks Chapel, and I'd go all the way up to the top of the stairwell, and I would pray. One of my prayers was to, that the Lord would bring me a, 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 a great spouse, and he really did. In fact, I didn't realize even at the time that we got married what a treasure she was. We've been married 36 years now. 